they knew. On closing arguments, in Portland, Oregon, Nancy Brophy wrote an essay called How to Murder Your Husband. Now she's accused of actually doing it. We have the latest from day one of the romance novelist murder trial. Nancy had everything she needed at that point to carry out and conceal the murder, except the experience of shooting a firearm. Nancy got up on a Monday morning and started researching how to load a Glock 9mm. In Broward County, Florida, jury selection has begun in the penalty phase of the Parkland school shooter. The individual selected will determine if Nicholas Cruz gets life or death. I knew he wasn't okay when he punched the window in and said, I'm going to cause karma one day. On the docket tonight, in Fairfax County, Virginia, movie star Johnny Depp getting ready for his upcoming trial on Court TV. Depp is suing his ex, Amber Heard, for defamation after she accused him of domestic violence. We have a preview of the trial. I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. Plus, Johnny Depp called ex-wife Amber Heard's claims of domestic abuse a hoax. And now, Heard is suing Johnny Depp. Tonight, we ask you, the 13th juror, will Amber Heard be able to prove her counterclaims? Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of closing arguments starts right now. Good evening and welcome to Closing Arguments. I'm Michael Ayala in tonight for a vacationing Vinnie Politan. And tonight we been with, begin with a case that would make Agatha Christie proud. As Vinnie loves to say, trials are about getting to the truth. But when the truth is closely aligned with fiction, as in novels and articles written by the defendant herself, how does a jury decide between what is fact and what is fiction? It's a case with tons of circumstantial evidence. But when you are a mystery romance writer, a lot of what is so-called evidence could just be research. And therein lies the rub in the case of Nancy Brophy. Today was day one of the romance novel murder trial in Portland, Oregon, where 68-year-old novelist Nancy Brophy is on trial for the murder of her husband. Court TV crime and justice reporter Matt Johnson has background on the case. The wrong lover, the wrong husband, and hell on the heart. These are the romance novels penned by Nancy Brophy. But did they become a script for murder. Nancy Brophy is accused of killing her husband, Dan. We're given four dozen oysters to each team. In this tribute video put together by the now-closed Oregon Culinary Institute, Dan, a chef instructor at the school, is seen helping his students. On June 2nd, 2018, students found his body covered in blood. He had been shot in the back and chest. They rendered aid, but were not successful. Nancy took to Facebook to mourn her husband's death. She wrote, I have sad news to relate. My husband and best friend, Chef Dan Brophy, was killed. I'm struggling to make sense of everything right now. Nancy's neighbor, Susan List, reflects on her memory of the Brophys. They kept to themselves most of the neighborhood does, but from what we could see, it was just a normal neighbor. The couple lived in this home less than seven miles from downtown Portland. Susan says Nancy had a special place reserved in the house just for writing. I didn't know if she wrote so many books. They had an open house one time that we went and looked through the house and it looked very nice. And she said, this is where I write my books. And so it looked like a really nice little nook. According to police, they had fallen behind in their mortgage. But Dan's life insurance payments were paid and Nancy stood to inherit more than a million dollars from his insurance and workers' compensation policies. Police canvassed the area around the culinary school where Dan worked. Surveillance video revealed a minivan similar to the one Nancy drove in the same neighborhood the same morning that Dan was killed. According to court documents, when asked by investigators, Nancy Brophy stated that she was at home all morning. A search of Nancy's computer revealed more suspicious activity. Police found evidence of gun part purchases from websites eBay and GhostGuns.com. Detectives also discovered an eyebrow-raising article that she had written titled, How to Murder Your Husband. She starts the article by writing, 
As a romance suspense writer, I spend a lot of time thinking about murder and consequently about police procedure. Her defense will likely argue that the article is tongue-in-cheek and not meant to be taken seriously. But the state prosecutor isn't joking. She's been charged with murder in the second degree. Nancy Brophy maintains her innocence and has pled not guilty. All right, let's bring in the think tank tonight. Joining us in Stanford, Connecticut, criminal defense attorney Darnell Crossland. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, family law attorney Jennifer Brandt. And in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Al Wunsch III. All right, everyone, thanks for being with me tonight. Truly appreciate it. I'm going to start off by asking the question that just jumped right out me when we saw that, when I saw that we were going to be covering this trial is, it's a mystery romance writer on trial. Obviously, someone in that sort of genre is going to be doing certain types of research, research very important in this case. So, Darnell, let me start with you. Who does it help? that she's actually a mystery and romance writer in a case of murder like this. Well, actually, I'm not sure if it helps her at all because it sounds like uh, she not only had opportunity to murder someone, but she also knew how to do it. Um, so unlike a typical uh, housewife and husband wife situation where someone wasn't a murder or novel writer who knew nothing about murder, uh, she has a lot, of, uh, a lot more questions to answer than the average person. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you got, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence in this case, but it adds up. It kind of piles on itself. But you know what really jumps out at me, Jennifer, is this again, and we've seen this time and time again now, those search histories. They just get you, the things you're looking for, the things you're buying. And those that's really what I think where the strength of the state's case is here against Nancy Brophy. Yes and no, Michael. I mean, I disagree with Darnell. I think the fact that she's a mystery writer helps her because how many uh, people that potentially murder their spouses are mystery writers? And she could say, hey, I was doing research for one of my novels and I had to look up all these different things and I had to understand police procedure. I had to understand about guns. If I'm going to write a story that appears to be, you know, uh, accurate, then I need to uh, do all the, the research. So I think she has a perfect out. The problem that she has is, you know, we always run into this. If she didn't do it, who did? <laughs> I know that's not her burden to prove, but that's what the jury might be thinking in this matter. Al, once quickly, I want to get you to ring in on that. Who does it help? Is it a positive for the defense? It seems like it gives them something to work with. Well, let's take a look at her titles, okay? <laughs> the wrong husband, the wrong lover, the wrong seal, the wrong brother. Okay, so, and, and her motto is, wrong never felt so right. So perhaps this is a good situation for her. I mean, it's, if she was writing books that were like, I love being with my husband, but then she's looking up how to kill him, that might be more of an issue, I think, with people down the line. But the fact that every one of her stories deals with some sort of like, if, if this is what they say, strong women, uh, pretty men, strong women, about families that don't always work and the joy of finding love and the difficulty of making it stay. Those are the catchphrases with regards to her books that are on the back of her books. So she talks about this kind of stuff. And let's all remember back in 2003, a certain individual by the name of Pete Townsend, okay, used a credit card to get material about child porn on the internet and was arrested for it and then claimed, oh, I'm doing a book about my life and I was abused as a child, so I wanna see what I experienced when I was a kid. So, and that worked for him. He, was, he got a, a slap on the wrist and went forward. So people can be looking things up. It doesn't necessarily mean it's criminal. Yeah, absolutely. And just the appearance. I mean, you look at her. She's a little old lady. She's writing these novels. I think all that definitely works in their favor. Stand by, folks. I want to bring in uh, Court TV crime and justice reporter Matt Johnson. He's joining us live tonight from Portland, Oregon. He was in the courtroom all day today. Matt, now we heard opening arguments today. So get us caught up on the cases that were presented by the state and the defense. And I understand we learned from opening statements that Nancy will, in fact, testify. That is the bombshell right there, Michael. That is the big headline, the takeaway from today. Nancy Brophy, this romance novelist, she's had four years behind bars to write what she's going to say on the stand, and now she is going to do it. But prosecutors, they're going to question her on why her car was seen in that area the morning of the murder, why she had 
unusual statements to say and questions and why she called police, including this recording. Take a listen. We'll talk about it. Okay. I don't want to do, but this may give you a laugh this afternoon. Uh, I don't want to be the stupid question of the day, but I think I need to be the stupid question of the day. Uh, so okay. my insurance company said, well, just have the detective write a letter that you're no longer a suspect. And I said, man, I just don't know that he's there. Uh, huh? And I'm not sure that he looks at that way. But if you do, I get you to write the letter. My sister, when I told her this as a lawyer, laughed so hard she fell out of the chair. So. Why? <laughs> because. Why would you need that? Because they don't want to pay if it turns out that I secretly went down to the school and shot my husband if I thought, Hey, going into old age without Dan after 25 years, it's really what I'm looking for, you know? <laughs> okay. And well, so, we we never would do something like that. I, I, did, I really didn't think so. Yeah, I mean, that's not something that we, I, I, we, never, we never do something like that. That's never been done. I've never yeah. heard of that being done. I, I was shocked when he told me this. And the other thing he says, well, I said, so what happens if, in fact, based upon your, and this is, this is such a stupid little policy. I can't believe they're making me jump through the hoops like this. This is only $40,000. And as my sister said, you know, usually when they do that, it's for millions. And I said, yeah, we weren't sure for millions. Uh, but, uh, but the other thing is, I said, what happens if, in fact, this case never gets resolved? And they said, well, that has to go to um, uh, up to the supervisors to be evaluated. And I'm thinking, great. So did you catch that? Uh, the Portland Police Bureau detective right here in Multnomah County in Oregon kind of chuckling, saying, I haven't gotten a request like that before. And then Nancy, in that uh, recording, says that it's only for $40,000. We know that that's not true because of all of the policies that she is accused of signing up for her husband for life insurance. And prosecutors say that this motive adds up to $1.5 million. Yeah, it's Michael. all about that motive. And, and you know, what was interesting. I found out a number of those uh, insurance policies she actually sold herself, uh, sold to herself. So then I found that very interesting as well. Now, you are our eyes and ears in the courtroom, of course, Matt. So tell us who was in the gallery and how they were reacting to the statements made by both the state and defense. Well, everyone is looking at the jury and how they are accepting some of the information, the opening statements, and I'm specifically focused on the two individuals in front of me, Karen Brophy, which is the victim, Daniel Brophy's mother. She stares over at Nancy across the courtroom anytime there is a reference of his death or guns in this particular case. And also Nathaniel Stillwater. Now he is uh, Daniel Brophy, the victim's son from another marriage. And I spoke with him just a few moments ago outside the courtroom. He said that um, he's really not doing any interviews right now until he testifies, which is expected sometime next week. He also has a civil case pending against Nancy Brophy. More on that. But um, he he basically said that uh, he's holding up the best that he can right now, just trying to get through this. I mean, this has been years in the making. And his dad was a pretty famous guy here in Portland, much more famous than his stepmother. All right. And all right, Matt, then the jurors actually heard from the state's first witness today, a student at the victim's culinary school. Tell us about the state's first witness. Kathleen Dooley. Well, she was one of the students that unfortunately arrived early that day and found one of the professors there, Dan Brophy, dead, and she called 911. Um, I want to play part of that for you right now. Take a listen. Um, hi, we are at um, uh, Oregon Culinary Institute, and um, there is somebody collapsed in uh, uh, one of our kitchens. Okay, one just of our a staff. moment. And what's the address there? It, what's the address? 1701. 17 what? Southwest Madison. 17. 1701 Southwest Madison. No, 1717 Southwest Jefferson. 1717 Southwest Jefferson. Yep. Yeah, he's, yes. Okay, and. He's one of our chefs and he's an older man. All right, is he like, conscious right now? No, he is not conscious. Okay, is he breathing? No, he is not breathing. Okay. And does anyone, is anyone doing CPR? Yes, yes. Okay, someone's doing CPR right now? Yep. Do they, yep. Do they need instructions? 
Do you need instruction or do you need, do you need her? Are they doing compressions okay. only? She's, she's, yeah, she's doing compressions. And um, I can switch out too if you need to because okay. I'm uh, CPR certified. Okay. All right. And did, do you know the cause of this or what happened? Did he just nope, collapse? No, we have no idea. Somebody just found him on the floor. Okay. She cried there on the stand, and she continued to cry out in the lobby here. Um, now, as the next witness was getting ready to take the stand, Michael, which was an instructor, um, also there that day of the murder, um, the two chatted for a little bit here in, in the lobby out in front of the courtroom, and they hugged, and they cried. So it's a very emotional case, and this is highly emotional for everybody in this community of Portland. Yeah, great stuff there, Matt. Truly appreciate that. And finally, I also understand that you got an opportunity today to visit the crime scene. Tell us about that. Right. I went there yesterday as soon as I landed boots on the ground here in Portland. I was uh, I served this community for about four years as a morning anchor for one of the affiliates. So I knew exactly where to go and things have changed quite a bit. But at this particular location at this school, it went bankrupt. It's now considered a blue star donut. But all the doorways and entrances are the same. I noticed that there are no cameras. It's a very residential area. There are apartments above and across the street. But where the surveillance video came from that was brought up today in opening statements by the prosecution, that was just a few doors down over at a pizzeria. And then also with the mass transit, that's what's going to be introduced in this case, where prosecutors say that they can point Nancy Brophy and her car at the scene that morning, not in Beaverton, which would have been more than 20 minutes away from this location in rainy Portland. And of course, that's what she told, or that's where she told police she was that night. So it'll be interesting to see how it all works exactly. out. Matt, thank you so much for that report. Truly appreciate it. When we come back, we're going to take a quick break, folks. But when we come back, day one of jury selection in the penalty phase of the Parkland school shooter. How close are they to seating a jury? We'll let you know. Don't go away.
and find the car you need all on your phone. And I hope you give me a chance to try to help others. If, you, if I believe it's your decision to decide where I go and whether I live or die. Not the jury's, I believe it's your decision, I'm sorry. Now that was Nicholas Cruz after entering his guilty plea for 17 counts of first degree murder and 17 counts of attempted first degree murder. For the February 14th shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in 2018. And now jury selection has begun in the penalty phase of his case. The jury will recommend to the judge whether Cruz should face the death penalty or life in prison for pulling off one of the deadliest mass shootings in U.S. history. Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janet is joining us now live from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She was there for today's proceedings. All right, Julia, um, get us caught up on what the latest is in jury selection. Well, right now, Michael, we are just at the very beginning of what's going to be a drawn out process. The judge even laying out for these potential jurors what they are going to expect, not only if they are impaneled, but if they move to the next round, there are going to be multiple phases for this jury selection. Today, the court was able to question 160 potential jurors. There were about 20, 22 of them who actually were cleared to the next round, but they have many hundreds more that they are going to go through. And the judge has let this jury know that May 31st is going to be this trial date, leaving two months worth for them to get through these jurors, question them about their hardships, but also about their opinion on the death penalty. All right. Now, what can we expect from the penalty phase? Julie? Well, we can expect that this is going to be a focus on aggravators and mitigators. We don't have to worry about the guilt phase as we would typically in a murder trial because of that guilty plea that Nicholas Cruz entered uh, back in October. But now both the prosecution and the defense are going to be putting on a lot of evidence. This is expected to be a three month trial at least. That's what the judge is letting these jurors know that they need to clear their schedule for. As far as those aggravators, the prosecutors have said that their reason for asking for the death penalty in this case has to do with how atrocious and heinous this crime was. The amount of people it put at risk, 17 slain people there at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School back on February 14th of 2018, and also 17 who were injured that day uh, who are uh, part of the charge for attempted murder against the defendant. Uh, the mitigators, we know, as far as what the... Uh, defense will try and put forward to ask this jury to save Cruz's life. They will be digging into his mental health history. They'll be talking about his upbringing, his background. Florida law allows for a long list of things that the defense can bring up as a mitigator. And there's a catch all in the law that says really any evidence that they feel may assist in defending him. It's valid inside of that courtroom. You know, Julia, in looking at all the different motions, et cetera, et cetera, and reading through some of the information regarding the trial, it almost looks like this is going to be a full-blown trial. There's a lot of evidence that both sides want to either get in or keep out. Um, so is that fair to say that there is going to be a ton of evidence? When you're talking about almost two and a half months for a, uh, a penalty phase trial, it's almost unheard of as far as my career is concerned. Oh, it's absolutely going to be a full-blown trial. The way these jurors are being questioned, it really starts with the horrific killings. And these jurors are being told that this is the person who did it. Yes, that doesn't mean that they have to find for guilt, but they really have to go back to the very beginning of this case. The judge is even saying that it's her practice now to look at these potential jurors. And if she sees any kind of emotion or something that upsets them, she's going to take them to the side, move them out of the group and question them individually because this is one of those cases that has deeply affected the members of this community. Today there was a female juror who uh, came in and when all these jurors were asked if they knew any parties that were sitting at the tables, she answered that she had met the defendant before and that prompted an interesting exchange with the judge digging into just how much that might impact her position as a juror. Let's take a listen to that. Um, you said that you've met the defendant in this case. Yes. And do you feel that you can serve on this jury and be fair and impartial? Yes. You do? 
Yes. Okay. So am I reading your you incorrectly when I, it, it appears to me I don't know if you're nervous or you're or you're getting upset about the situation. Are you are you? Um I'm upset about what he did. Okay. Well, What happened upsets a lot of people, and and he has uh, pled guilty, and so you have a right to your opinion, and you're still you still could be eligible if you feel you can keep an open mind, be fair and impartial, and follow the law. If you feel that you cannot follow the law and you cannot be fair and impartial, then. Perhaps you're better suited for another jury panel. It's nothing personal, but but sometimes it is personal for certain people. And without asking you exactly um, how you know him, or I, I don't know how how much you are comfortable telling me. I'm I'm not uncomfortable sharing any of it, really. I guess. Um... But initially, I, I do feel I could be fair and impartial. Um... Based on on the the interaction that I had with him, there is some argument to be made of him being like um, like mentally not together. I, I don't I couldn't necessarily say that I could I agree with that after. Um, okay, so given your knowledge of the defendant, Mr. Cruz, or of the circumstances surround surrounding this case. The crucial question is, can you be fair and impartial, and can you follow the law as I instruct you? It sounded like there, first of all, this juror said that she could be fair and impartial. Uh, but the judge also wanted to see if her position on him having mental troubles that she seemed that she could tell when she met him before the shooting, who that would be in favor of. But ultimately, this juror said that she felt that the death penalty would be appropriate because not of his actions, but just how she felt about the death penalty in general and capital punishment, that she as a taxpayer wouldn't want someone sitting in prison for the rest of their life. So that is the statement that ultimately got her dismissed from this jury panel. Michael, I also want to point out who's watching this in the gallery, and that's the family of the victims watching everything unfold this first day of jury selection. Luke Hoyer's uh, parents, Tom and Abby were there along with his sister Gina. He was a 15-year-old student there at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Also, Jamie Gutenberg, 14-year-old who was killed. Her father, Fred Gutenberg, also watching and asking for emphasis on the victims in this case. We also noticed Richard Moore, who was on there on behalf of Zachary Cruz, the brother of the defendant. He's also the person whose home the defendant was living in at the time of the shooting. This was after his mother passed three months before that. We can imagine that that'll be a topic that this defense will bring up in front of the jury. All right, Julia Janae, thank you so much for that report. Truly appreciate it. As always, now it's time to bring back in my think tank, criminal defense attorney Donnell Crossland, family law attorney Jennifer Brandt, and criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Al Wunsch III. Jennifer, I'll start with you because you heard Julia there talking at the end there about the families being in the courtroom. And that's an aspect of this case that perhaps people can't forget, is that this fam these families are still living through this tragedy after all this time, and now they have to go through it again. But I guess at this point, it could eventually be cathartic for them. It could be cathartic, but I think I can imagine, and when I heard that, I can imagine how hard that is for the potential jurors to see those, the, the victims' families in the courtroom, I, just all the emotion that's in the courtroom. I just think that impacts how they might feel about the case. That might make the jury selection just that much harder because seeing them, understanding what they're going through, how could you not be sympathetic toward them? And, you know, maybe state your feelings one way or another or against the defendant. Um, and maybe you can't be impartial uh, having everybody there. I'm kind of surprised that everybody is sort of allowed in to watch all of this and, you know, with the jury selection um, and, and watch the potential jurors and hear what they have to say. That's going to be hard for the family in itself. So yeah, Darnell, I, I mean, tough. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's incredibly tough. And Darnell, you know, it's, I mean, part of what this whole process now is all about is giving the family the opportunity for closure, to have this opportunity to hear and see this evidence. I would imagine that's important. But my question for you is, um, how do you even go about getting a jury as a, if you're representing uh, Cruz in this case? I mean, I, it's going to be an extremely emotional case. Uh, a lot of really horrible evidence is going to be put in front of that jury. How do you even pick a jury in this case? Well, I agree with you. Um, this is unusual, uh, unusually long period of time. Uh, I'm preparing for a federal sentencing that's coming up Wednesday. And in all sentencing hearings, it's about putting on mitigators um, to ask the judge for leniency. Three months of mitigators, I'm not sure like how that's going to play out. That seems like forever. Um, you know, I'm a trial lawyer. I like the trial portion. The sentencing part, I don't like too much because, you know, you, you put some good points out there and you ask the judge for leniency. But three months of that is tough. I think the main question here for this jury is, 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 is kind of, um, as kind of raw as it might sound, is can these jurors pull the trigger? Can they uh, be death qualified? And that's the bottom line. If, if, the, if these jurors can't put someone to death, then they're not qualified. Now, I do agree if they're going to put someone to death just to save money, because it's economically sound, that person has to get bounced like the person who got bounced a second ago. But other than that, the question is, can you put your emotions aside and can you pull the trigger? And I think that's what this comes down to. Um, so uh, in terms of mitigators, they're going to bring up the mental health issues. In terms of aggravators, they're going to say that this guy was expelled from school. He knew what he was doing. He was angry and he went up there to kill these people. And that's going to be an aggravating factor. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the uh, mitigating factors has to be his age. I mean, in light of what the Supreme Court has recently said, we know that he was uh, under a certain age or the age that they pointed out. Uh, uh, and, you know, I think that is something that the defense really has to harp on as well. All right. Think Tank, stand by. We do have to take a quick break. But here's a look at what's still ahead on Closing Arguments. On the docket tonight, in Fairfax County, Virginia, movie star Johnny Depp getting ready for his upcoming trial on Court TV. Depp is suing his ex, Amber Heard, for defamation after she accused him of domestic violence. We have a preview of the trial. I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. Plus, Johnny Depp called ex-wife Amber Heard's claims of domestic abuse a hoax. And now, Heard is suing Johnny Depp. Tonight, we ask you, the 13th juror, will Amber Heard be able to prove her counterclaims?
0-2-3. On the docket tonight is the upcoming civil trial of Johnny Depp versus his ex-wife, Amber Heard. Now, Depp is suing Heard for defamation after she allegedly accused him of domestic violence in a Washington Post editorial. Now, Depp has already had a libel suit thrown out in the UK after he sued a newspaper for publishing an article labeling him a wife beater. Now, truth is the ultimate defense in a libel case, and a judge found that what the paper wrote was mostly true. Undeterred, Depp returned to the States and is hoping to have better luck here. Now, in Johnny Tepp's complaint, he listed quotes from Amber Heard's op-ed that he claims are false, defamatory statements about him, even though she never named him in her op-ed. And that complaint reads, the sexual violence op-ed contained the following false and defamatory statements concerning Mr. Depp. Amber Heard, this is her, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change. Then two years ago, I became a public figure representing domestic abuse, and I felt the full force of our culture's wrath for women who speak out. She also said I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protect men accused of abuse. I write this as a woman who had to change my phone number weekly because I was getting death threats. For months, I rarely left my apartment, and when I did, I was pursued by camera drones and photographers on foot, on motorcycle, and in cars. Tabloid outlets that posted pictures of me spun them in a negative light. I felt as though I was on trial in the court of public opinion, and my life and livelihood depended on myriad judgments far beyond my control. All right, the think tank is still with us. Donnell Cross, Jennifer Grant, and Al Wunsch the third. Al, I want to start with you, because what Johnny Depp is, Depp is, claim, is claiming is that the motivation for these false claims by Amber Heard is because she wanted to improve her career or become more famous. I question that. I want to get your thoughts on that as the motivation for this type of thing. Why would a woman do that? I, I don't think that that is a, a motivation. In fact, if anything, it's probably smarter for her to have walked away from all of this and not have this go through again. I mean, she technically had won already in England and now he's bringing it over here. I don't know what his point is. To go after her for $50 million that she probably doesn't have in the first place. For what purpose? Now he's back in the paper with all the salacious headlines, all of these horrible things that she, he's accused of. The judge didn't believe him in England. What makes him think that you know, the colonies are going to do any better? It just doesn't make any sense in this situation that a guy like this is doing it. I mean, granted, he, all right, he lost some business on it. <clears throat> He's not, you know, he'll eventually get back into the swing of things. I mean, look, you know, me, you know, Mel Gibson has gotten back into movies. We, we've seen other people that have done stupid things and have made horrible comments get back into the business after a while. I mean, I'm sure even Will Smith may get back into a movie every now and then since uh, his little slap incident. But in this situation... What he's doing is he's ripping the Band-Aid off and he's also ripping off the scab. Very foolish thing for him to be doing. Yeah, Jennifer, you know, it does seem a little bit over the top and I wonder what his motivation is. The only thing I can think of is maybe he thinks he's really not guilty of these, these crimes or this battering, but, you know, that's for another day. But the thing that I, th I wanted to point out to you is that what Amber Heard says is even continuing today online, our viewers are not very happy with Amber Heard, and I think, and I'm wondering if you think she's going to face this in the courtroom. Now, again, she's still up against Johnny Depp, one of the biggest stars in the world, seemingly based on online and the things that she's saying, very much beloved. So that's going to be a problem for her as well. Definitely. And so you ask why Johnny Depp's doing it. He's doing it just for that reason. He got shot down in England, but here, I mean, he is. He's he's. He's worshipped here by a lot of people. And so this only helps his image in that he's trying to say she's the liar, she's the bad person. In the court of public opinion, I think people are still saying that they look at Johnny Depp 
you know, and they say, oh, she must be wrong. She's being vindictive and she's the wrong one. So it is helping him maybe um, revive his career because he did lose parts and he, he did lose some money because of this. And look, these people were once married. They loved each other. And as a family law attorney, I can see this happens a lot. People are angry. Love turns to hate. And then they're out to get each other and they're vindictive. And that's what's going on here. It's not about the money. It's not about the $50 million. I think it's about getting vengeance and showing that he's right and he wants to prove a point. So I think that that's what's going on here. Yeah, from reading through the filings in this case, these are two people I don't think ever really belonged together. Things started fairly quickly after they got together. Donnell Crossland, uh, of what import is it that he has actually never mentioned in that Washington Post op-ed. Is that important? Could that hurt him in court? Well, I, I think, you know, if we back up just a bit, this is definitely, uh, is, is it, the question is, is this an Ike and Tina Turner? No. Um, is it a Jesse Smollett, a hoax, as, um, as Depp is uh, claiming? It's not. Um, what it is, is uh, Ms. Heard writing a piece about women who suffer from domestic violence and all that she's um, seeing and as an advocate for this, she's expressing that. And, you know, as counsel pointed out, Depp has just used this opportunity to now get back at her from what happened in the Sun uh, lawsuit. Now, in the Sun lawsuit, uh, the judge found, again, it wasn't an Ike and Tina Turner situation, but they used the word that she was attacked at least 12 times, whatever attack means. Um, so was she extremely abused, such as, in, again, in the Ike and Tina Turner situation? Um, no. But was she attacked, harassed? Maybe yes. And so she's writing about this. She's writing about her experiences. She never called his name, and I think that that's a strong point for her to fight this. Um, he could just uh, he can extrapolate that she's talking about uh, him, but that leaves the burden on him to show that, and I don't think he's going to be able to do that. Well, you know, Amber Heard, she's admitted to being involved in some physical altercations with him. He's called her an abuser. She, he's going to get on the stand and say that to this jury. She's going to get on the stand and tell them he was the abuser. It is going to be the one of the most, uh, you know, incredible, he said, she said, stories we've ever seen here on Court TV. And a quick reminder for you folks, Court TV cameras will be inside that courtroom for this trial, which is set to begin next Monday, April 11th. And lead anchor Vinnie Politan will be live in Virginia next week as this trial gets underway. So you don't want to miss that. All right, it is time now for us to step aside and take a break. When we come back, we'll hear from you, 13th juror. We asked you about Amber Heard's counterclaims against Johnny Depp. Now, she's suing Depp for defamation as well, claiming he defamed her by calling her a liar and a hoaxer. Do you think her counterclaim will be successful? Your verdict when we return.
96.9. Johnny was hitting me, and he was hitting me hard and repeatedly. Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. This is going to be one of those big trials to watch. You have these big celebrities that are going to be testifying. Their reputations are at stake. Johnny Depp was not successful across the pond, but he's got a second bite of the apple, this time in the United States. Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. Live coverage starting next Monday at 9, 8 central on Court TV. The defamation case between celebrity exes Johnny Depp and Amber Heard is set to begin next Monday, April 11th. And before we took a break, we looked at parts of Johnny Depp's complaint. But Depp isn't the only one claiming defamation. Amber Heard has filed a counterclaim against Depp. And according to her complaint, she says before he was even married to Ms. Heard, Mr. Depp threatened to kill her and otherwise harm her in private messages to friends. Now, these threats were realized in the form of rampant physical violence and abuse is heard suffered at Mr. Depp's hands before and during their marriage. Now, this frivolous lawsuit Mr. Depp has filed against Ms. Heard continues that abuse and harassment. Mr. Depp and or his agents acting on his behalf have orchestrated a false and defamatory smear campaign against Ms. Heard that has included false and defamatory statements to reporters repeatedly accusing <clears throat> Mrs. Heard of being a liar and a hoax artist and accusing Ms. Heard of the crime of perjury. Now, through this counterclaim, Ms. Heard is finally, after all these years, fighting back. Ms. Heard asked this court to hold Mr. Depp fully and finally accountable for his conduct and to end Mr. Depp's abuse lodged from a position of wealth and power. So, we posted to our social media pages and we asked you, the 13th juror, do you think Amber Heard will be able to prove her counterclaim against Johnny Depp? Let's begin with our 13th juror comment of the day from Sue, who says she could probably provide proof of some wrongdoing from Depp, and Depp has proof of her battery history as well. This is going to be a public slugfest that will, the only winner will be the press. Guys, I think, you know, what's interesting about that is I think that's exactly right. And as I said, it's just going to be two famous folks, one a lot more famous than the other, on the stand, slinging more abuse at each other. Um, Jennifer, how do you think this one turns out? I, I don't think either of them are going to be successful, to be honest with you. But I do think that um, it'll change views in the court of public opinion, as we said before, you know, and I think that's probably the biggest outcome out of this. We'll all be watching. Um, it may raise their rankings. I mean, maybe they will get both of them get more movie parts after seeing this trial because they're going to be in everybody's mind. Um, we're all going to be looking at this and watching what goes on and the famous witnesses coming in. It's going to be uh, certainly something for uh, people to, to watch and be interested in. No question about it. Our next comment comes from PG90 on YouTube who says she has already lost in the court of public opinion. And, you know, Al, that, that's absolutely true. I can tell you honestly from the comments on our website and in other places where I was researching today, people are not happy with her. They do not like her. And I, for the life of me, can't understand why. Do you have a, any I, I, idea why it's that way? I, I have no understanding as to why. But I, I am going to be sending her as a gift from me a, a copy of uh, Miss Brophy's book, The Wrong Husband. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that, that it's the least I can do for her to send this to her. She'll maybe be able to understand better as to the choice she made. She doesn't deserve this grief. I mean, to be honest with you, like, look at Johnny Depp. He looks like a bum. I mean, he looks like a guy who's you know, spending $50,000 a month on wine. Don't get me wrong. I'm impressed with that. But, I mean, you know, this guy is just beyond redemption as far as I'm concerned. She is the innocent victim in this. She she may have fought back, but then again, you get to a point and you push and, you know, someone throws popcorn in your face and you shoot them, okay? We've seen this happen in court TV, all right? So, you know, I, I say that it. let's all take a look at this from the standpoint of he's not the lovable pirate that you see saying yo-ho-ho in a bottle of rum, okay? This is a guy that once he gets in some rum into him, is a dangerous individual and someone that has taken you know physical violence out on this woman it's never tolerated it should never be accepted and we should not be going after her she's suing him as a counterclaim which means that he struck first so we should remember that 
And All right. Just if you get an address for me, Michael, so I can send the book, I'd be <laughs> most appreciative. All right. I'll have the producers reach out to you there. Great stuff, though. I really like that. All right. And Martin commented tonight saying this is going to be a 100 percent. He said, she said, and maybe both of them will get nothing. They may both be guilty. Uh, but what's interesting, Darnell, is even if they're both guilty of abuse, that doesn't mean that Amber Heard's counterclaim still can't win because her claim is that he's calling her a liar by saying that he abused her. It really doesn't have much to do with her abuse of him. That, that's exactly exactly right. The question is not about the abuse. It's a question about who's lying about it. And, um, you know, just to uh, back up a little bit, one, I, I don't want Al to send that book to her at all because I don't want to give her any ideas. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I did some research in preparing for the show today, and it was very interesting to find out why this was in Fairfax, Virginia. And it appears that because of the Washington Post articles went through computer servers in Washington that it ended up there. And so, you know, every day you learn something new about the law because I, I didn't realize that that would be a jurisdictional uh, reason. Um, second thing you learned about Fairfax, Virginia, is that the largest trial they've had was the 2002 uh, sniper case in D.C. That was the closest they came. So when you have Elon Musk and other people testifying in this case, um, it's going to be something very, very different um, that you've ever seen uh, in this area before. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see how, in fact, this plays out. I personally think, as the 13th juror said, I got five, that it's going to be just 10 a, seconds quickly. How is this going to turn it's out? It's just going to be a, a, a press victory. That's it. All right. Thanks, guys. I really want to get big thanks to my think tank, Donnell Crossland, Jennifer Brandt, and Al Wunsch III. Thanks for joining me tonight. It's always a pleasure to have you all on. All right. We have to step aside for a quick break. When we come back, much, much more here on Court TV.
37-year-old Florida mother, Cassie Carley, was seen more than a week ago. Now the sheriff announcing her remains were discovered in a shallow grave in Alabama, and the father of her child is under arrest. Cassie Carley, who's been missing now for about a week, um, we discovered her body while executing a search warrant in Alabama. In tonight's unsolved case file, a Maryland man reported missing in 2019 after he failed to show up for his cancer treatment. Tonight, our investigators weigh in. What happened to Chris Dieterich? He went towards Locust Lane and they went a different way and that was it. No one ever saw him or heard from him again. His phone turned off probably within the hour. In Riverside County, California, officers take down a murder suspect. We have the dramatic video. Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of closing arguments starts right now. Good evening and welcome back to Closing Arguments. I'm Michael Ayala in tonight for Vinnie Politan. We begin this hour with a case that began in Santa Rosa County, Florida last week. 37-year-old mother Cassie Carley was last seen on March 27th in a Florida restaurant parking lot where she was meeting her four-year-old's father, Marcus Spinevolo, for a custody exchange. Now, Carly's car and purse were found just two days later on a boat overflow ramp near the restaurant. Now, over the weekend, after an extensive search, the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office announced that Carly's body had been found in a shallow grave in Alabama. Now, her child's father was arrested in Lebanon, Tennessee, where he is currently being held on charges of tampering with evidence, giving false information concerning a missing person's investigation and destruction of evidence. Missing, of course, is a murder charge. More on that later. The Santa Rosa County Sheriff Bob Johnson held a press conference about the case yesterday. Here's a look at some of what he had to say. So Cassie Carley, who's been missing now for about a week, um, we discovered her body while executing a search warrant in Alabama. It was in a, uh, a uh, barn in a shallow grave. So it's not the ending that we wanted, obviously, but um, we're hoping to provide a little closure for the family. And also, as you know, as we reported earlier, the suspect is currently in jail in Maury County, Tennessee, on charges of tampering with evidence and giving false info reference missing persons investigation. Um, our major crimes unit, I can tell you this, I've never been more proud of them. They've served multiple search warrants in multiple states, traveled over 1,500 miles in a week ser searching for evidence in reference to this crime. So I want to thank them, but I also want to thank FDLE, FBI, uh, Fish and Wildlife, um, Texas, or excuse me, Tennessee Highway Patrol, Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, Alabama uh, Investigation Division, St. Clair County SO, Alabama, Springfield P PD, Alabama, Walton County, Bay County, and Okaloosa County um, for all for their assistance. That tells you how far out this went. Um, we're just proud that we've got this guy in custody. Uh, obviously, more charges will be pending. Current depending on the autopsy, which will occur tomorrow morning. Um, if you have any questions in reference to extradition or charges that will be pending on him, I'll defer to the state attorney. So do you have questions? Yes. Do you guys know how she was killed? No. The, the autopsy will reveal that tomorrow, hopefully. Has he been cooperative with this investigation? Absolutely not. No. What was... What was the tip or what was the information that led you guys to this place in Alabama? Are you guys revealing um, where she was found exactly? No, um, and we're not revealing how we found that location either right now. So you got to remember it's an ongoing investigation. So um, we can just tell you that we had uh, information that led us to that place. We got a search warrant and we discovered the body. I'm sorry, you may have said but her body was found overnight or this morning? Or? Um, it was found yesterday evening. Is the chef connected at all to Mr. Spanabella? Um, it is in a roundabout way, but we can't get into that either. But it, he does have a connection to the property. Or I would say if the body was found like in, out in the open or covered or anything like that. No, a shallow grave. Um, regarding the previous charges, can you get it all into what evidence he tampered with and what evidence he might have destroyed? Um, yeah, it was in reference to the victim's phone. 
he took her phone and basically got rid of it. So. Were you guys able to ever locate the phone? Yes. Yes. Okay. Where? Um, we're not going to go into that one. And how did he lie to investigators? What did he lie about? Um, he lied a couple of times, actually, in, di in different scenarios. But uh, what, what was the exact same thing? I think we just have clear convincing evidence that the information he gave us was materially false. Yeah. Uh, that, that we were able to confirm. How did the police encounter him yesterday? Was this during a traffic stop? Or? Yeah. Oh, actually, our detectives went to Tennessee and got with the uh, Tennessee Highway Patrol and um, Tennessee Bureau of Investigations, and they did surveillance, surveillance, found him, and took him down on his traffic stop and arrested him. It's obviously Thursday when you guys had the other press conference. It was mm -hmm. clear that he was a suspect or a person of interest. You guys were keeping tabs on him. Right. Do you feel like he was on the move at a flight risk? Do you think he was trying to leave or hide? Or? Well, I don't. I can't speak for his thought process. Um, I can tell you this: he was totally uncooperative. He never cooperated at, at all with us, um, and that goes a long way. I mean, you think about it: it's it's your baby's mother, and she's missing, and you're not going to cooperate with authorities. That's kind of telltale. All right, so now the district attorney later on would say that once they figure out and do the autopsy and figure out the cause of death, we could see murder charges in this case. All right, let's bring in tonight's guest. Joining me in Clearwater, Florida, private investigator Mike Peasley in Salt Lake City, Utah, private investigator Jason Jensen, and in Navarre, Florida, a special guest is joining us by phone, Cassie's sister, Rayanne, is with us. I want to thank you all for being with me. And Rayanne, I want to start with you first and foremost uh, by expressing our condolences from all of us here at Court TV. I know this is a difficult time for you, so we truly appreciate you joining us on the show. And, and I'll begin with you by asking you how you and the family are in, in fact holding up. Oh, thank you so much. Well, we're holding up. We're okay. Um, we've got sailor coming on the way home and so we'll have a little piece of Kathy with us and we're doing we're going to be just fine thank you so much all right and I was I wanted to turn next to the good news the fact that the the, the child is alive uh, and it sounds like it's going to be a happy reunion tell us a little bit about that how she's doing and what's going to happen going forward oh she's doing amazing um, we're looking forward to having her back home with grandpa and auntie and everyone else just ready to shower her with a bunch of love, so. Yeah, that's fantastic news. Um, tell us a little bit about Cassie. I know you were on recently, uh, for those who might have missed it. Um, tell us a little bit about her, what she was like, what she liked to do. Oh, my sister, she loved the beach. Loved the beach so much, outdoors, paddle boarding. She's just got the biggest smile that you walk into a room and or she walks in and just lights the whole thing up. She is one of a kind and truly the brightest soul I've ever been honored to know. That's wonderful. And I'm, again, we're, we're really sorry for your loss. Mike Peasley, let me get you into the conversation here. This was an interesting, in that press conference, the sheriff talked about the effort that went into getting the information that they had here. They said they covered about 1,500 miles. Uh, they were serving warrants, chasing leads. Finally, of course, the hard work and all the legwork led to results, not the ones they wanted, but certainly it was able to give the family some closure. Uh, your thoughts on the cooperation there between apparently a number of different departments and all the work that went into getting this done relatively quickly. Kudos to the police department on this one for uh, how fast they worked on that and the time that they traveled and the search warrants that they executed. Um, you know, doing the same as they did on several cases uh, when I was in law enforcement, it takes a number of agencies to collectively put everything together. And I thought they did a great job on this. Yeah, I think that's the only way to describe it. Cassie, I know you're probably thankful. And, and he mentioned, um, I'm sorry, not Cassie, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> Rayanne. Um, the, the sheriff mentioned that, in fact, um, he thought this might bring closure, the fact that they were able to find uh, your sister. I wanted to check in with you. Did, in fact, it provide that for you? Oh, yes. Tremendous, tremendous relief and closure. We're just so happy we can bring her home and make her comfortable now and celebrate her life. All right, Jason, let me check in with you real quick. You know, during the press conference, um, we didn't hear it here on the air, but they talked about the fact that, you know, this guy was truly and utterly uncooperative and, and flags went up. 
And quite frankly, the ones closest to the people who end up disappearing or, you know, worse, unfortunately, are, are the first people you look at. But when someone like this is uncooperative in this situation, the red flags have to go up all over the place. Yes, yes, I, I would agree, Mike. He definitely put a target on his back by not cooperating, number one, because, you know, the chair. All right, looks like we might have lost Jason there. All right, we'll get back to him in just a second, Rayanne. Let me bring you back in very quickly. You know, one of the things in, in reading about this case was that your sister had mentioned uh, to quite a few people, actually, that um, if something were to happen to her, they would know where to look. And that, of course, was the gentleman who was arrested, Marcus um, Spinevolo. Um, did you know him at all, or did she talk about their relationship at all? Yes, um, yes. And I had met him the very first night. I got a bad vibe from him <laughs> and let her know. Um, there were many red flags right from the start. And uh, my sister, she'd always feared, and she was taking the proper steps. There were many exchanges where my father did ride with her, and he has a concealed carry. And um, she was taking the proper steps, just unfortunately, um, that's why we fear it may be planned, because he was extremely nice and uh, recently, so I think she had her guard down a little bit. Mm. Yeah, again, Mike Peasley, you know, these, these child exchanges... You know, they often give advice to folks to do it in public places. It seems like Cassie did, in fact, do that. It was in the parking lot of a restaurant, yet things went sideways. Anything else you can tell us about these exchanges, how dangerous they are, and ways to make sure you stay safe when these situations arise? Well, first and foremost, my, my thoughts and prayers go out to the family. Uh, at least they have closure and they have the little one coming home. You know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned here. <laughs> Uh, especially when the family or the ex um, has funny feelings about that. You know, we always tell people, meet in a police station, um, make it public, a big public place. I don't know what escalated the, this guy's behavior at this point. Um, and I could be wrong, so the family would have to answer that. I think recently they were talking um, Cassie was talking about uh, getting more child support. Um, was there problems with the visitation? So, yeah, the lesson to be learned here is, is um, I always tell people, do the exchange in a police station uh, or in a public uh, place so that there's cameras and stuff. All right, excellent advice, Rayanne. We do have to go take a quick break, and I'm going to let you go, but I want to give you an opportunity to say some last words to our audience. You know, we'll continue to follow this case, of course. Anything you would like to leave us with? Yes, I just wanted to let everyone know I appreciate all the condolences and support, and thank you for helping bring Kathy home. Mission was accomplished, and we are starting the Kathy Carley Foundation, so please stay tuned. My sister's story lives on. All right, Ray Ann Colley, once again, I want to make sure to express our condolences and you stay strong. Uh, gentlemen, stand by. We're going to take a break. Uh, Jason Jensen, Mike Peasley, you guys are staying with me. When we come back, a private investigator involved in the search for Cassie Carley will actually be joining us, so don't go away. We'll hear what she has to say about the search for Cassie Carley.
or your money back. I know you said he wasn't cooperative. Is he speaking now that her remains have been discovered? No, all he said was lawyer. That's all he said. And does he have any known criminal history with this department or any other that you have? Not that I'm aware of, no. That was Bob Johnson, the sheriff of Santa Rosa County in Florida, announcing at a press conference Sunday that a suspect is in custody following the discovery of Cassie Carley's body. Now Marcus Spanavello, who shares a child with Cassie, was arrested and is being held in Tennessee on charges of tampering with evidence, giving false information concerning a missing person's investigation and destruction of evidence. Still with us, private investigators Mike Peasley and Jason Jensen, and also joining us now in Pensacola, Florida, a private investigator who worked on the search for Cassie Carley. Lauren Vellucci is with us. Thanks again for all of you being with us, and Lauren, thank to you, thanks to you uh, for joining us this evening. And I want to pick your brain first uh, about this um, case and the investigation as you were involved in this. Um, tell us a little bit about your involvement in the investigation. Well, it's a small community. It's a small area. So when I first heard she went missing, um, I instantly was like, what can I do? And so I reached out to the family to see if there's anything I could do. The FBI then was involved. So there wasn't a whole lot of help that I could provide for them other than what the FBI and FDLE was already doing. Um, so I, I said I would search. And so that's exactly what I did. Um, domestic violence is something that I've experienced in the past. So that put an extra um, spin on my just wanting to be there to do anything um, to find her. All right. So tell us about this search and, and where you searched and how that came together and the folks that got involved. Every day was different. It was a very fluid um, investigation. So the sheriff's department was also in contact with people um, at the command center. So each day was different. There was days that we searched in dumpsters. There was days that people on paddle boards went out to search the shoreline. There were days that we passed out flyers and, and just put them anywhere that we could possibly think of. Uh, we went to an old amusement park that was in the 90s that was completely wooded um, and went in there to see if we could find anything. So it was constantly changing um, and it was really anywhere. Anywhere that they sent us, we were going. All right. Now, I also understand that you were uh, you attended a vigil. Tell us about that vigil and who put that together and how that went. Yeah, so the searchers, the command center, her family, her friends, um, we didn't even know if they would be there because the news had just came down that they had found their body. But as you can tell in the last segment, her sister, her family, her friends are so strong they wanted to be there. So they got on Facebook and said, come out, we're going to celebrate her life. And sunset was her favorite time. And so that's exactly what we did. And boy, the community showed up. They all came out. We had um, some wonderful just things about Cassie that made us feel like we personally knew her, the sheriff there speaking. Um, and it was it was good. It was a good thing. I think it brought a lot of closure um, to not only the family, but to the community and the people who, who feel like they now know Cassie because of this. You know, Jason Jensen, I want you to speak to how important it is, this community involvement, uh, folks going out, doing this type of searching, holding these type of vigils. All that plays a part uh, in helping to solve these types of crimes. Oh, yes, they do. I mean, to be, to be clear, there's a lot that goes into finding a missing person. You don't know where they disappeared to. So clearly uh, a department has a finite number of, of, you know, its deputies, if it's a sheriff's office. And so they really need to reach out to the community to have as many feet on the ground, searching every possibility, because before you know it, evidence gets spoiled and there's no way to find out what happened to the person once they do find them. Now, Mike Peasley, were you surprised at how close to the vest the sheriff was with information? Didn't really want to give information about how he found out certain things like uh, the connection to the property of the uh, person that was arrested. Um, didn't want to give very much information at all. Are you surprised by that? No, because when you got an open investigation <laughs> like that, uh, there's, there's certain things that, uh, you know, you want to 
keep at uh, arms, uh, especially if he lawyered up. Uh, the state has, you know, obviously evidence that the sheriff has. They know what's going on with the state attorney's office or district attorney's office. So it doesn't surprise me that he was closed look with that. Now, the, the, the person arrested, Marcus Spanavellos, Benevolo, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his name. I do want to emphasize he is innocent until proven guilty. So we do not know if he was, in fact, connected to this. But, Lauren, I want to check in with you. When you found out um, what the ultimate result of the search was and, and what, the, uh, what was found, uh, what was your reaction to that? Well, I'm sure you were hoping against hope that she would be found alive. But, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Yeah, it was, it was crushing. We were actually out there waiting to get our next area to search. Um, when the press conference happened and we all kind of watched it together and it was crushing. Um, but I knew that that was what the family wanted was to be able to find her and to bring her home. And it, it happened relatively fast. They were on it. Um, and I just, when I spoke to her father, um, when I met them and her friends, I told them, I said, listen, he gave you guys a gift by having that 35 foot trailer on his truck because going through surveillance would have taken forever. So I think they were really on top of it and knew the direction he went. And uh, I just, I'm so happy that they found her and he put her in a grave. He put a roof over her head so that her body will be able to tell a story. It's going to let us know what happened and we will get him in court and hopefully court TV tries it or, or covers it so that we can see it um, because she needs justice. Yes, and once again, just a reminder to you folks, uh, there's still an autopsy to be performed. That's why there are no murder charges just as yet. If, in fact, it turns out it was a cause of death that warrants it, then we'll probably see them. All right, Lauren, I want to thank you so much for joining me this evening. Truly appreciate you. all of your insights. Thanks very much. Jason Jensen, Mike Peasley, you're going to stay with me for a little bit longer. It is time now for a quick break, but there is still a lot more to come. Here's a look at what's ahead on Closing Arguments. <laughs> In tonight's Unsolved Case File, a Maryland man reported missing in 2019 after he failed to show up for his cancer treatment. Tonight, our investigators weigh in. What happened to Chris Dieterich? He went towards Locust Lane and they went a different way and that was it. No one ever saw him or heard from him again. His phone turned off probably within the hour. In Riverside County, California, officers take down a murder suspect. We have the dramatic video.
Welcome back. Now is the time in our show when we open up the unsolved case file. And tonight... We're taking a look at the disappearance of 41-year-old Chris Dietrich. He was last seen in May of 2019, and his family reported him missing that June when he didn't show up for his cancer treatment. Mark Roper, a reporter with our great affiliate WAMR, has more on this story. Chris Dietrich is loved and missed by his younger sister, Sarah Dietrich. We knew we, each other had each other no matter what. And there was no judgments ever from any of us, you know, either side. Like, he could tell me anything, I could tell him anything. He was my best friend. He was my big brother. My Elkton brain. Police Sergeant Ronald Odom recalls the last time Chris was seen in Elkton was on May 29th, 2019. Uh, the last known location that we have him at is the health department across the street from our, our station. We have him on video there. We know he left there. After that, we don't know where he went. Chris's sister, Sarah, did a bit of investigating of her own and talked to a couple of people who knew him in Elkton. And he said they'd, he talked to them later and he went towards Locust Lane and they went a different way and that was it. No one ever saw him or heard from him again. His phone turned off probably within the hour of the last time he was seen. Chris's family says he had a life on the streets but lived behind this house on Locust Lane. Police searched Meadow Park where Chris liked to go on occasion near the cow pond. But besides following up on a few tips about the places Chris would visit or the people he would hang out with, Sergeant Odom says the leads on this case have since gone cold. Everything that we've gotten up until this point has been followed up on interviews. We've done search warrants. Um, everything following up on social media. Um, we just don't have the information to give us a general idea of where Chris is. Elkton police hopes someone has the information they need to find him. You may think it's unimportant, but believe me, it is. We'll take anything to follow up on and continue to do that and follow up on the information as it's presented to us to make sure that we hopefully do everything we can to find Chris. Chris Dietrich has a tattoo on his left calf which reads, Pear Jam. By mistake, he was supposed to read Pearl Jam. He also has a tattoo of the San Diego Chargers logo on his left shoulder. He walks with a limp and has a swollen left foot due to ongoing health issues. And Chris's 44th birthday is December 16th. We hope we can get the information out, maybe to the public. Somebody that doesn't know anything or thinks they know anything may trigger their memory and they can contact us. Um, somebody that maybe would recognize Chris and say, oh, hey, I remember talking to him and I remember him saying X, Y, or Z. Let me call the police and tell them this information. Which could help find Chris and answers for his mother, Pam Wiseman. We want him back. I want to know what happened to him. For, just because we need to know. We need some closure. Now, if you have any information at all, please call the Elkton Police Department at 410 398 4,200. Again, that's what this is all about, folks. Keeping the name out there, keeping this hope alive. We can perhaps find Chris Petrie. All right, still with us, private investigators Mike Peasley and Jason Jensen. Also joining us is a special guest in Nottingham, Pennsylvania. Chris's sister, Sarah Dietrich, is with us as well. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Truly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. So again, all our condolences from folks here at Court TV for sure. Uh, we don't know where Chris is or what has happened. But what I want you to do is bring him to life for us. Tell us, tell us who Chris was. Tell us about your brother. Um, my brother was a very helpful person. Um, he loved everyone in his life. Um, he would do anything for anyone. Um, he was a great father, um, an awesome brother. Um, he was just an all-around great person. Um, I, I don't know why anybody wouldn't do anything to him or this would even happen to him, but he loved his family very much, and he just he just wouldn't disappear. Uh, speaking of his family, we're actually joined now um, by his mom from Chesapeake uh, City, Maryland. Uh, Pam Weissman is joining us as well. Pam, thank you so much for taking the time out to be with us tonight. Thank you. All right, let's start off with you now and find out. Well, I'd love to know, um, your, you, tell me about your son. What, what can you tell us about him to enlighten us, to bring him to life? Well, he was a very, very charismatic person. Um, 
whenever we had a party, people would just say, oh, your son is just so pleasant to be around. Um, he, he was just like a really, really great guy. Um, he was fun. Um, he might not have always been the most responsible and he got himself kind of in a bad way, but he, he was very loving. He cared about everyone. Um, he made friends easily. He, he was just, um, a, a great, a great son. Now, Sarah, um, I know you did a little bit of investigating early on. Can you give us an update? I mean, the, 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 the officer in the story that we saw said that things have gone a bit cold. Any updates at all? Anything positive to report in the search for your brother? Um, actually, after the last airing of um, that video, um, some people reached out to me. Um, I gave those tips to the police. I've heard absolutely nothing back from them. Um, and the tips I heard were the, the people that I've been in question with the entire time that I've told the detectives the entire case that I feel know something, but no one's ever really looked into the information that I have put forth. Um, because of course it's hearsay. There's no physical evidence, but it's all stemming back around to the same people. Um, I've put in calls to say, Hey, did you follow up on it? But no one's called me back. So I really don't know where the latest lead I got from this, you know, from this video that Mark Roper did, um, it did spring some memories to a few people, but I've heard nothing back. Um, I wish I knew how to do this by myself, really, instead of relying on, on them. Um, I feel I've gotten further into information this entire case than I ever have. Um, I still look every day I search around Facebook. I ask questions. I, you know, I, I have ears and eyes on the streets of Elkton. I, I, I'm never going to stop. Let me tell you that I will never give up until I find him. Um, I hope it's sooner and later for my mother's sake and for his children. He will be 21 this year. Um, I just want to get closure for them. Yeah. And, and I'm glad that we can do our part here on Court TV to keep his memory alive. And, and hopefully someone will see something and more information will come out. But I also have two experts here, Mike Peasley and Jason Jensen, who perhaps can provide some insight to you for more things you can do. Mike, let me start with you. Any advice for Sarah in her search for her brother, what she can be doing? You hear that there's a little frustration I'm hearing in her voice regarding uh, police and following up on things that she'll provide them. Give her some advice. You know, if... if um First and foremost, uh, uh, again, we can only pray that there's a recovery of your brother. And so prayers go out to you. You know, I found over the years, and I just finished something here um, out of state. Don't totally depend on the police department that you're dealing with. Um, you know, I don't know what their caseload is. I don't know what their experience is. But if you feel that you have tips or you feel that there's something that's of importance that should be known, you can go to your sheriff's department there. Uh, you can go to the state on that and see if they're following up. The police should not just stop talking to you and just say there, it's a no end as far as their investigation go. I do have one question for you guys. Uh, you may know this or not know this, but when the sergeant was doing that, that interview there, he talked about search warrants. Uh, he was homeless, right? Yes. Well, he was he was homeless, but in a way, but not in a way. He had a place of residence um, where he stayed. Um, he would shower there, eat there. Um, he had the ability to sleep indoors, but did not want to. So he slept in a tent in their backyard. Um, but that's where he received all his mail. Like I said, he would shower and eat at this residence. Um, and I, was I just found it in contact. Yeah, I just found it interesting when they said that they were executed search warrants. Uh, you yeah, know, it wasn't uh, the Tana residence search... he lived at. Okay, was that the only search warrant that they did? Um, it was actually different, I guess, um, places where they knew that like homeless people would go to. Um, there was a certain lady that would um, take some of them in, um, but it, they, they have never not 
once even gone to the house where his last known residence was. Um, they've never searched it. I've asked why not. Um, and my, my response was from them was, hey, we didn't know there was a struggle, so there's no reason to go search someone's home um, when we know there was no struggle that happened to him there. Um, so that was their reason why they didn't go look at the at the residence in the backyard where the tent was anything. Um, so the search warrants, I guess, it, I, there was a house by the police station, but it was not where Chris was um, last known to be staying. All right, let me I just get let me just get Jason Jensen in this mic. Stand by for a second, Jason. Uh, any any advice that you want to give uh, both Pam and Sarah as they continue the search for their brother? Yes, yes. I I'd like to start off by you know bringing up the fact that we have a passage of three years now, and he's disappeared. So the question that we really want to wrestle with is what caused him to disappear, and it would you know going back to the earlier beef in a box segments somebody was responsible for cassie's disappearance i fear that somebody made chris disappear and the last person that that you talked to sarah said that he was walking towards locust lane that was the the street that he lived at so i'd start with the residents there and find out from them did he actually make it home that day was he stopped on the way home, to home uh, were the people that you talked to actually being honest about the last time that they saw him? And really start there because somebody had it out for him is my fear. And that's what I concentrate on is who had it out for Chris Dieterich. All right. Well, Jason, thank you so much for that. Uh, Sarah, Pam, thank you so much for joining me tonight. We're going to continue to do our part um, to hopefully help someone or help uh, the police find your brother. We'll be here for you. Uh, hopefully you'll come back and join us again. Thank you. All right, and I want to say thank you to Mike Peasley and Jason Jensen Thanks. as well. Thank you so much for being with me this evening. Always a pleasure to have you guys on the show. Time now for a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to bring in our law enforcement experts as we take a look at some body camera video out of Riverside County, California, where officers take down a wanted suspect He's a murder suspect. We'll keep it right here on Court TV.
directly from Copperfit. It's crime time here on Closing Arguments. Let's bring in tonight's guest. Joining me, former senior special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration and the founder and CEO of Global Security Group, David Katz. David was an instructor at the DEA FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, where he actually, I think we got the wrong guy. Can we switch and get the right guy up? There's David Katz, where he taught firearms and tactics to thousands of federal agents, state and local police officers, SWAT teams, and specialized military units. He is a corporate security expert and is particularly well known for his active shooter prevention and response programs. David is also the author of Executive's Guide to Personal Security. Also with us, now bring him back, former police officer Joe Estead. Joe is also a former sheriff's deputy and police investigator. He has served in Afghanistan as a police advisor and is the author of the book Police Brutality Matters and the host of the Police Brutality Matters show on YouTube. All right, gentlemen, thank you both for being with me tonight. Sorry about that little mix-up, but we got it straightened out. Our first story tonight comes to us from the Riverside County Sheriff's Office in California, where officers take down a wanted murder suspect. Take a look. He's hitting the dog. Hit him. Go. Still refusing to come out. He's in position of a like a bamboo stick that's about a foot long. Multiple 40 deployments, closing the door, and pulling the dog off for now. Bang, bang, bang. Open the door! Yep. Door's open. Let me see your other hand! Driver's door open. Step on out, man! You gotta step out! He's reaching for something. Okay, come on out! Can I see your hand? There you go. Stop right there! His whole body is out of the car. He's laying face down. Can you go on top of the box right next to your right side? And everything worked out fine, and our question for our law enforcement experts after watching that is, how tense are these takedowns? All right, let me start off with you. Um, David, tell me, you know, what I saw there, um, the use of the dog was pretty interesting, and then there were these explosions. Explain to me how tense these situations are. You know, obviously they have, they know he's a murder suspect. <clears throat> we obviously thought he might be armed. You know, they, they, I could pick some, you have some, you have too many guns pointed at the guy, you know, someone in the, you know, you can see the guy up on the truck. I, I you know, I don't, don't want to be, be too picky. And what really bothers me, though, I hate when they put the dog in harm's way. Dogs are great. They are, they are law enforcement. They're military's best friend. But once they saw that dog was, was, was getting prodded or poked or stabbed by that stick, now it's time to go to plan B. Joe, I want to get your take on that situation. Just how tense are they? And you, just your assessment of how it was handled. Yeah, it's tense, but this is requires a lot of training. So these guys should be used to it. This is a tactical team. Um, I like the fact that they didn't just rush in like we've seen time and time again. Officers always want to utilize time. They want to utilize space. So I like the fact that when they had one option fail the dog, they went to another option. They went to the beanbags. So I, I like the tactics. I like the way they took their time. You had one officer giving commands. You didn't have a bunch of officers yelling like we've seen in the past. When you start looking at officer actions and how consistent they are with training, these guys was on with the few minor errors that they described. All in all, everybody gets to see another day. So this was a good tactics. This was a good job for, for everybody. You know, David, that, we, 
Joe's answer raises a couple of questions that I have when I'm watching it. You know, as he said, sometimes you see folks rush in. In this particular one, there was time, there was space. So how does, how does that play into these situations? How much time, how long is too long, and how much space is too much space? There's, there's no time limit here, and there's no, there was no exigent circumstance. They could have let this go as long as, as long as they needed to. So I agree with Joe. Time in this case works works for the officer, not against. You don't want to go up and send send an officer in to try to go hands on when you don't have to. He could have had a weapon. It could have turned out badly. The way as it turned as it turned out, they were patient. They were able to use. I mean, you have so many other. You have tasers. You have chemical munitions. You have 40 millimeter uh, kinetic impact projectiles. You have uh, 12 gauge beam bags. You have so many things you could use. But right now, in that particular case, their best friend was just take a little bit of patience. Yeah, and I think, it, as we saw, it worked out well for everyone there. All right, moving on. Our last story tonight comes to us from the Chicago Police Department, where police are searching for homicide suspects. And the question we have after watching this is, how can you identify these individuals? All right, Joe, let me start with you. I mean, you have the camera, you have the videos, you have the neighborhood. Shouldn't be terribly difficult. No, I think they have enough to put the pieces together. Uh, like you said, we have the camera, and you got a good look at them. You got three subjects. They are armed with uh, firearms. Um, so nine times out of ten, when you got that many subjects and all of them are armed, that location is a pretty hot location. So. You see the direction of travel that these guys, uh, these suspects ran at. I would backpedal to see if I have any additional cameras from anybody's homes on that particular block. I would use the media and I would put a lot of pressure on that neighborhood to actually uh, get some more information. So I, I think these guys will, will get apprehended because you, you got a good picture, so you could do some race, some uh, face recognition. So I, I think this is going to be a, a good one to solve. Yeah, you know, David, what's interesting is when, when I look at these and, and from my, my experience in, in sort of the criminal justice world is a lot of these crimes, they're committed close to home. I, I imagine these guys don't live far. They're on foot. I don't know if they were running to a car or anything, but your thoughts on that? Yeah, Joe's exactly right. What's gonna, what they're just going to they're gonna retrace their steps. And there's, there's going to be a point in time when they're on a camera without their masks to, on. So they get a good ID. And I would, I would posit this. This, this was a coordinated this was a coordinated attack so the intended victim or, or, or the people on the street know who the beef was with they, they have these people identified already there's no doubt in my mind so just a matter of time yeah i would have to agree with you there that's a pretty high caliber weapons there it looked like as well all right gentlemen thank you so much for joining me tonight joe Estad and david katz um really appreciate it sorry time was short but to have you on have you on again soon for your all your expertise all right folks it is time now for a break but when we come back we're going to have a photo to show you of a child who isn't home tonight and should be. We'll be asking for your help to find him when we come back. So keep it right here on Court TV.